we are in 2 Corinthians chapters 7 to 9. Somebody please read. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. All right. So this is actually the, the, the verse we, we ended on last week. It is the first verse of, of chapter 7, but it really is a continuation of the thought process uh, from chapter uh, 4, I believe, 5 and 6. Uh, Paul wants the church to look forward, be forward looking again for himself. He was undergoing persecution at the very at the at the hands of the very church that he's writing to and uh, yet he chose not to be bitter uh, but the position that he took was uh, one of expressing the comfort and the joy that God granted him as a result of his suffering Paul uh, took a, a, a particular stance, his position during his trial and his suffering uh, was one that chose to glory in God and, 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 and recognize the hand of God that was upon him uh, during, during that time. I was at a graduation uh, yesterday, I was up in Connecticut at Yale University and uh, just this poignant remark uh, by one of the professors really stuck with me. Uh, it's, it's a quote, some of you may know it, uh, but it says, rather than curse the darkness, light a candle. Uh, and so for Paul, he could have cursed his situation. He could have caused the gloominess of his situation to uh, discourage him but he chose rather to use that to light a candle and to reflect the goodness of God, the grace of God, particularly uh, dealing with the, the future aspects of our Christianity, because whatever we're experiencing in this world uh, is nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. He used those words that as children of God, we must be forward looking that uh, he says in in first Corinthians, he says, if it is in this life only, we have hope, we would be as, as men most miserable. If you're looking for joy and comfort and peace in this world, in this life, uh, it is it is it is an exercise in futility. It doesn't matter uh, which party runs the government. It doesn't matter the state of the economy. Uh, you know, when, when interest rates were low and when Wall Street was booming, there, there were still problems, there were still issues. Uh, so issues are exacerbated on one side or the other. They, 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 they diminish, they rise, but they're always there. And so in this life, it doesn't matter how much money you have, who you marry, where you live. Uh, uh, the true peace and joy that our souls long for uh, will never be ex experienced in this earthly tabernacle. We, we're looking forward. He talked about uh, we have another tabernacle that's, that's in the heavens. We have a, uh, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we, we have another. God has, has, has a body for us. He has a better life for us that's beyond this, this current existence. So, so, so Paul uh, wanted his audience now to reach for that. It's important to preach it, to teach it, to express it so that people can reach for it. The reason why people today are not reaching for that heavenly home is because it's not being preached. Nobody preaches about heaven and hell anymore. It's all about wealth, blessings, material uh, things, and that's what people are striving for. You, you kind of get what you preach. So Paul preached uh, this, uh, 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 this, 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 this 
experience that is beyond this this life this current world that everyone should strive for and paul wants the church in corinth to know that it is within their reach all right it is within their reach okay uh, and so he wants them to understand that uh, the indicative should lead to imperative god has fulfilled his promises and will continue to do so if the imperatives are carried out. He will walk among his people, but if the Corinthians are to have God dwell among them, then this dwelling must be purified. All right. Uh, again, it is sometimes difficult to understand the, the realm of God. God does not dwell in our finite realm, in our linear time frame. And so what God has promised was fulfilled in Christ Jesus, but now it must be fulfilled in us. So while from God's perspective, it is eternally complete, there is a progression uh, of, of God's plan that it must be worked out in the lives of God's people, right? So, so, so whatever God has done for Paul and for the church at Corinth, the Corinthians, and for us, it must be worked out in our daily lives. It must be practiced in our lives. He continues in his desire to be counted. Notice that Paul always uses the inclusive plural pronoun, the we and the us. Let us cleanse ourselves. He's the pastor. He's the bishop. They are the ones who have wronged him. They are the ones who he has rebuked in the first in the first Corinthians of being carnal and babes and fornication and idolatry, but yet he identifies himself with them. He doesn't tell them that you need to cleanse yourself. It is always inclusive because when you you have to bring yourself to people's level so you can bring them to your level. That's what God did. He came down to our level so that we can rise to his level. So Paul always associated himself with the failures and the frailties of his audience because his plan was to win them over to his side. You gotta go over to their side to win them over to your, to your side. And Paul wants them to know that anything that stands in the way of becoming like God must be removed. Cleanse yourself. Because you have these promises. What are the promises? Not a big house and a nice car and a, and, and, and a lot of money. The promises, uh, they, are, they are in this life. Yes, they are blessings uh, that are guaranteed and assured, but they are primarily spiritual. When you talk about the Beatitudes, blessed are the, the poor in spirit, the meek, blessed are even men, happy, blessed. Those are, those are spiritual attributes are, are there some material blessings for the people of god sure they are but they're not uh primary uh the disciples said to jesus we've given up houses and lands and everything he says what are you going to get he says in this life you're going to get those things back but in the end you will receive eternal life that should be the promise that we are striving for and paul says since you have these promises cleanse yourself there's something you need to do uh to, to remove from yourself anything that defiles the promise of god's approval and fellowship is based on christian desire and effort all right uh, again there's there's a mainstream doctrine today that says you know anything you do uh should not be counted as to, uh, towards your salvation but again uh, the scriptures uh, are clear uh, it's on both sides right because it is grace that is applied and given to us by god but grace requires effort it requires a response that's why ephesians 2 8 tells us you are saved by grace through faith grace is on god's part it's not something we earn work for or deserve but active faith is the appropriate response to god's grace so even though God confers holiness upon us, it is incumbent upon us to apply effort, energy. The Holy Ghost actually is an aid.
to assist us in this effort to cleanse ourselves. All right. Uh, 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 uh. The object of cleansing is to remove every defilement uh, from the believer. And, 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 and this is very important. This thought came to me. Uh, loving is not approving. See, this is where some people get confused, right? Loving is not approving. God may love you and yet not approve of you. And all parents should be able to say amen to that because there are children you love, but that doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. See, right? Okay. And if, you're, if your children commit such acts that you believe that they are unworthy or unqualified, to, 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 to manage your affairs, even though you love them, uh, you will give your sign of disapproval, uh, disapproval by not allowing them certain inheritance or to manage certain affairs. And it's the same thing with God. Don't, don't, don't ever conflate the two. That's what the world wants you to do, that, to believe that, that just because God loves you, he approves of you. No, he loves you. But he, he gives you his spirit, his Holy Spirit, and confers his righteousness upon you, confers his holiness upon you. But the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? The Holy Ghost is given to aid and assist you so you can live a life that is approving to God. You're not trying to earn God's love, see? You're not trying to learn his up or trying to earn his approval for salvation, all right? But you have to work so that God's presence and his favor can continue to be upon your life. You have to remove every defilement. Those who profess to have accepted God's grace must not deceive themselves, right? Through living in a way that is holy, set aside for God's service, we must seek to be separate right? And holiness has a negative and a positive connotation, right? You set yourself away from some things, but also onto some things, away from things that corrupt and defile, and you set yourself to, towards God. To be effective witnesses, believers must be seen as accessible. So we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? So we must discharge our call into the world only if we are in the world. Paul wants the Corinthians to continue in the work that God has assigned them, but we must learn how to minister to the world without being affected by the world. And, and, and a great analogy for this are the angels. See, it, 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 it's really amazing, right? When you think about how uh, Christians conduct themselves today. Because the, the word angel, really, they, they are ministers. They are ministering servants. It's the same role that has been given to us. We operate in the roles of angels. When, 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 when the book of Revelation is written to the angel of this church, to the angel of that church, right? Well, the angels are spirit beings, yet they are sent forth to minister in an ungodly world. And... When the angels have completed their task, they hasten to return to their heavenly abode. We don't see the angels getting themselves defiled and mixed up with the worldly affairs. We don't see the angels consorting and becoming as men, as a matter of fact, in our Bible. And I really don't agree with Genesis 6 that it was angels. Uh, but let's consider that, uh, 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 you know, theological debate that it was angels who came and mingled uh, with women. Well, the Bible says that God has reserved them under chains of darkness. When we consider another angel who defiled himself by consorting with the world, Lucifer, he was cast out of heaven. So whenever an, a minister or a servant of God uh, became overly acquainted with the environment he was sent to minister, minister in, he was discarded. He was rejected, right? That is the example for us. We don't hear of angels wearing polka dot and, and, and uh, uh, burlap and, you know, all kind of stuff in heaven. You know, they're all wearing white. They are dressed in white. They are they're, they're showing what? Purity, right? They remain pure. They minister in the world, but they're apart from the world. They minister in the world, but they're separate from the world. And that is the holiness that God 
has called us to. Next slide, please. I have the highest confidence in you, and I take great pride in you. You have greatly encouraged me and made me happy despite all our troubles. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction, with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. But God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. When he told us how much you long to see me and how sorry you are for what happened and how loyal you are to me, I was filled with joy. So we've covered this, that, that, that persecution for true believers is the norm. It is the norm, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul, everywhere in prosecuting his apostolic mission, he met with trials, he met with all kinds of tests and distress, and he was cast down, he felt depressed, he, he went through all of that. We, we know the story of Elijah, uh, greatest prophet of the Old Testament, who had a mental breakdown and contemplated committing suicide we, 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 so 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 there are many things that 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 good men endure as christians we we must be prepared to 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 experience these things right uh, what what are what are the things that cast down the soul of the righteous the prosperity of the wicked the triumphs of wrong fraud in trade corruption in politics moral filth in, 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 in culture and literature and, 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 and even in religion, right? The, even the non-success of Christly labor, uh, disinterested love, inflexible loyalty, depressing moods on account of little success resulting from the, the, the toils of ministry. Elijah felt like he should commit suicide. Jeremiah said, I'm not gonna speak anymore in God's name. Uh, Jesus Christ must be preached, saints, and this is the task that the Apostle Paul undertook, is a task that preachers, pastors, evangelists have undertaken. And the only reward for those who are genuine is the love and the loyalty of the saints. Listen, you want to have banquets and big, you know, dinners where you, you know, give big gifts and all these things? Great, awesome. Some people love that. I'm not really a fan of it, honestly. Uh, what a true pastor, a true leader, a true shepherd desires and requires from those that they labor amongst and give so much of themselves to. Because remember, the, 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 the Bible says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The enemy is always firing darts at the leaders. It's the leaders who are under the most attack. And when the people who they serve and endure the attacks for also join in the attacks, that can be the most depressing uh, experience for a leader. All that leaders are looking for from those whom they serve is just your love for God and your loyalty to the truth, saints. You want to give your pastor a gift, just be faithful, just be loyal. That's it's, it's the best gift. There, 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 there are there, there, there are you know I, I tell the folks I, plaques and trophies and all that. I have no space for them anymore. I really don't have no space for them anymore. They, they really don't mean as much to me as to see saints of God faithfully living out their calling, uh, 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 you know, just being faithful to, to service, to serving, to prayer, to living for God, uh, enduring tribulation, withstanding correction, just, you know, just want to be led, want to grow in God, excited about the kingdom and reaching others. There is nothing that brings more joy and satisfaction to a servant's heart. Next slide, please. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry that at first, for I know it was painful 
to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience lead us away from sin and result in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lack repentance result in spiritual death. So there was a individual in First Corinthians that Paul was addressing who was prominent in the church and uh, was guilty of uh, committing fornication and the people in the church did not address it. In other words, some believe that the person was of influence, perhaps a leader, perhaps a, a, a great contributor, and uh, they did not address that. And then also there were others who would come to the church in Corinth and try to uh, uh, destroy uh, Paul's reputation. And so Paul had sent Titus and written letters to try to address this, and he had to correct them. It was a tearful letter that Paul had written to them. So he says here that I'm not merely writing to chasten you and to obtain justice and redress uh, and redress a wrong, but uh, that our care for you in the sight of God might appear. See, sometimes, you know, when, when, when you were kids, or if you have a little child and you know you, you're trying to teach the child not to touch the flame uh, oftentimes the child can get mad or get angry or resent your restrictive action because they feel like they're being denied some freedom or liberty when at the same time as a parent you're doing it for that child's well-being it's the same scenario here where sometimes in the church, the pastor has to take corrective measures. And while the measures may seem harsh, and you know, some of us, we, we, we form relationships, friendships in church. We, there are cliques that are formed in church, and that's why we kind of warn against such things, because you can become so involved with someone that the wrong the person does, like this man who committed this sin, the wrong uh, uh, was not of any consequence to others, again, based upon their relationship. Sometimes relationships blind you. You can, you, 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 can, you can like somebody so much, you can become so cozy with somebody that it becomes difficult to correct them or rebuke them, see? And so Paul, in trying to benefit the entire church, must address the wrong. Sometimes your pastor has to address a wrong. And it's not just about dealing with the individual who's committed the wrong. It's also for the benefit of the church. Okay? So this letter is necessary because I want the whole church to know that I, 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 I love you and I want to preserve. Remember that God's presence will only dwell in a, an, an atmosphere of purity, okay? God's, God's presence will only dwell in an, in an environment of purity. And, and, and while someone's sin as an individual uh, can be tolerated, when that sin begins to spread and corrupt and defile the body, sometimes it's better to remove that 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 person or that issue it's like in your physical body uh, uh, uh if if your if your foot has a sore well we try to deal with the sore but if it now becomes gangrene and begins to spread well they may have to amputate the foot it's the same thing that they, while there are there are faults and failures and sins in the body of christ sometimes god has to intervene by way of the pastor to now address this individual or this wrong, not so, yes, for the benefit of the individual because you want them to 
um, uh, amend their ways, but also for the benefit of the church, that it doesn't spread and corrupt and contaminate the church. See? So, so, so in writing this tearful letter, this was Paul's objective. He did not know how they would respond because, again, uh, 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 he had been disparaged, okay? But he wanted to promote repentance, godly sorrow, the sorrow that produces reconciliation and restores fellowship. That's the, that's the, that's the purpose of correction. It's the purpose of rebuke. We, we, we take correction today and people, well, I'm not going back to that church. Well, he, you know, pastor preach against me. Well, you know, and we take it personal when we don't realize that it is, it is out of love for your own benefit. The worst thing somebody can do for you as a Christian is allow you to continue to live in your sin. That is the worst thing a person can do. And anybody who does that does not truly love you. We, 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 we try to interpret uh, 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 appeasement as love, right? We, 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 we try to interpret appeasement and being nice and, 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 and you know, just, uh, just being warm and friendly. That, that, that's love. No, sometimes love has to tell us the truth. Love is corrective. Love sometimes is punitive. And, and, and that is real love. As parents, you should know that. See? So Paul was expressing the love he had for them, and he wasn't sure how they would respond. But as godly children, he was proud that his corrective letter yielded the proper result. Oh, how a pastor would love for when he corrects people, they can see themselves, humble themselves, repent of their wrongs, and says, you know what? I'm sorry. That's that's why I love people who can be corrected. I love people who we all we all do wrong, saints. Doing wrong is not the problem. The problem is can we take correction? Can we follow instruction when we allow pride to so control us that we cannot be corrected? That is the beginning of our downfall. And so <clears throat> this letter that Paul wrote brought godly sorrow and changes to the Corinthians. He wrote a tearful letter not to condemn anyone, but to allow them the opportunity to prove their devotion to God. When you're truly devoted to serving God, then you will withstand correction. We're living in a society, in a culture today, that nobody can tell you that you're wrong and nobody can tell you anything. Well, that's not how I see it. And well, this is what I believe. And, you know, it's the promotion of humanism right? It's the promotion of self. Well, guess what? It is contrary to true Christianity, right? True Christianity demands, it demands, it is obligatory, okay? That we must humble ourselves. And I know that, you know, there are uh, uh, leaders out there that uh, are, are, are wolves in sheep clothing and try to profiteer off of people and steer you around. I know that, uh, so you must choose your pastor well. And if you're not sure that a person that you can trust them as your pastor, well, don't consent to membership. Praise God. Nobody is putting a gun to your head and saying you got to be a member of a church. It is by choice. But you got to understand that once you make your choice, you're saying, I'm trusting this, this leadership. I'm trusting this pastor. I'm trusting this church that I'm going to take correction. I'm going to take instruction from my leader. Praise God. And that is how the church thrives, right? So Paul helped to guide them back to the path from where they had strayed, and it caused Paul to rejoice. Praise God. Amen. I, 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 I long to rejoice over even those who are backslidden and even those who have left the church. Again, listen, I have not a problem with any person not you know for even anything that they have done and 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 even studying this lesson kind of just warms my heart and, and and opens my heart up to receive amen these were people who were attacking paul they were attacking his 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 character his reputation but he never took the stance you know that some of us take well you know they let them go find somewhere else let them go somewhere else da -da 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 -da. no he as as a, as a father it reminds me even of moses they wanted to stone Moses, and yet Moses interceded for them. I, I want to intercede. I want to I offer an opportunity to everyone who has 
left the church, who have spoken against the church, who have done everything. But guess what? Come with the prodigal's heart. I, I, I don't want to be a son. I want to be a servant. See, that's the key narrative, praise God. That's the key part of that story, that he had a changed mind. He wasn't coming back with pride and self-will. It's pride and self-will that drove them out of the church. Praise God. Don't come back with pride and self-will. Hopefully, you learned your lesson because you've strayed. And anybody who is willing to come back and say, you know what? I just want to serve God. I just want to live for God. Guess what? The church's arms should be opened wide. Next slide, please. Just see what this godless sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish wrong. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. My purpose then was not to write about who did the wrong or who was wronged. I wrote to you so that in the sight of God, you could see for yourselves how loyal you are to us. So the sorrow that his letter produced was the sorrow that brought changes, right? It's godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation. Oh, if we could, again, as Christians, we all make mistakes. We all have faults. The, 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 the difference between those who will make it and those who will not is for those who will allow pride and, 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 and arrogance and hubris, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, for those who will allow these, you know, the, 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 the emotion of pride to control them, those are the Christians who will fail. It's not that we, all, we don't all make mistakes, we all do. Again, Paul included himself with the Corinthian church, but he, he, he also said, listen, let, let, let us come together. Let us seek God together. Let us strive for mastery together. I, 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 I encourage everyone to join with us as we all seek to be better together. I'm not better than anybody. Praise God. I'm not more perfect than anybody. Amen. But 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 let's all seek for better together. What, what, what the church cannot withstand are those within who are fighting against growing in God, fighting against spiritual things, who want to remain in carnality and, and allow the flesh to rule. That, that's where the, the struggle takes place. But if, 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 if everyone will come to the place of true acknowledgement that I need I need more of God, and, and, and I, I'm grateful for my pastor who is trying to help me to get more of God by praying with me, praying for me, teaching me, correcting me. I may not like his methods. I may not understand his methods, and I may not even agree with the way he does everything, but I appreciate the fact that he wants the best for me, and so I'm going to humble myself, praise God, humble myself, and allow the word of God to cleanse me and change me. Those are the people who are going to make it saints, right? It's not about who is better than the other or who is more righteous than the other. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we all have to have a mindset that says we're in this together. We're going to strive to, uh, to make it together. And we are our brother's keeper, that we're going to hunger together. We're going to thirst together. And we'll co cover that some more as we go along. Next slide, please. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. So he turns his attention, we're now in, in chapter 8, and he turns his attention here to uh, collect, collecting a collection that he was gathering in the Gentile churches for the Jewish Christians. Uh, the, the, the church was headquartered in uh, Jerusalem. That is where the, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost fell, the upper room in Acts chapter two, and the headquarters was still there 
um, several other uh, places, uh, central places had developed. Paul himself was a member of the church in Antioch. That's where he was sent from. But Jerusalem was still considered the mother church. And in those days, again, like today, the you know, economy was up, economies down. They experienced wars. They experienced uh, famines. Uh, if you recall, again, primarily the church initially consisted of Jewish believers. Uh, we have uh, in, in Acts uh, chapter 8, we have uh, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch and those in Samaria receiving the gospel. In Acts 10, we have also Cornelius the Gentile receiving the, the gospel. And there was a, a meeting that was held in Jerusalem when Paul was converted uh, and was on the mission field, there were questions about even Paul's legitimacy and even the role of the Gentiles in the church. And uh, at that council, they declared that the Gentiles, as you know, they were accepted just as the Jews were. They didn't require circumcision. They didn't require the badges of Judaism uh, in order to be accepted as members. But there was still division among them that Paul had to rebuke Peter because Peter still maintained uh, an affinity to his Jewish identity. And again, Paul struggled against what we call Judaizers who were men who would preach still that uh, Gentiles needed to convert to Judaism to be fully accepted into the kingdom of God. So there was a rift between Gentile churches and Jewish churches. So Paul here remembering the Jewish council edict that went out that said that uh, Paul should go and minister to the Gentiles, but remember the poor. That was one of the things that was, was said. Do not, you know, stay away from fornication. Do not um, uh, deal with blood, but remember the poor. And so in Paul trying to fulfill his mission to the, to the church, the mother church, here was an opportunity for Gentile churches to meet the needs of the Jewish church. They were uh, uh, enduring famines. Now, the Gentile churches were made up of poor people. They were not rich people. They were poor people. And so uh, he is now uh, encouraging the Corinthians. Now that I've won you back, now that uh, 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 you know, you, you have a repented heart and, and you, you acknowledge me as, your, as your, your father in the gospel. I want to see proof. I want to see evidence of your, of your love. And he, he uses this church in Macedonia as an example to say that uh, their joy overflowed their affliction. They were, they were indeed poor, but they were rich in giving. Their liberality overflowed their poverty. Though they were poor, they showed themselves in generosity, right? Uh, the gift of the church of Macedonia was like the widow's might. Remember when Jesus was in the temple and he was standing and watching those giving the offering and he said, the, 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 the woman with the might, she gave more than those who gave out of their abundance. So, so Paul was commending the church in Macedonia for not just their giving, but what they were giving out of. They weren't rich, but they, they gave with joy to the necessity of the saints. Next slide, please. For I can testify that they have gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So here, here using again the church in Macedonia as, a, as, a, as an example, as a template, right, that he wants the Corinthian church and us to emulate, he says they displayed voluntary energy. They were eager, my goodness, not just to give, but they were eager to give to the needs of the saints. Again, here are Gentiles uh, who uh, just a few decades earlier 
the Jews and the Gentiles had no dealings. Jews could not enter into their homes. There was this great disparity between them. But now that they were in Christ Jesus and considered brethren, this church was eager to give to those who could have been considered formerly their enemies. They were so willing in the matter that they, they begged Paul. They begged him to allow them to share in giving. Wow. I want us to bring us to another level of understanding in our Christian walk, right? This giving was for the saints who were suffering, right? They were suffering chronic poverty, right? The Christians also suffered even more deeply. The Gentile churches would also suffer. They were they came from the humblest classes. They they grew, they were from ghettos. Uh, Nazareth, where Jesus came from, was considered uh, a ghetto, uh, and so uh, it was an incumbent upon the Christians to help them. They they were so poor; it was impossible to expect much from them. But they surpassed Paul's expectations. Right? If they were so poor; it was impossible to expect much from them. But they surpassed. Paul's expectation. And I like verse 5. He says, first they gave themselves to the Lord. Oh my goodness. I could, I could just preach on that all night, saints. That, 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 that the first act of giving, you know, we, we, we talk about giving tithes and giving offerings. Well, it, 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 if it's difficult to give tithes and offering, maybe it's because we have not first given ourselves. <laughs> right? The first act of giving, the Bible says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And, and until we completely give ourselves over to the service of God, then it's going to be difficult for us to give any, anything that we possess. See? You first have to give yourself to God. And then it will become easy to give everything else to God. Because when you realize that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and nothing that you have belongs to you, then you realize if I give him myself and if I give him everything I have, then guess what? I still haven't given him anything because it already belonged to him. Oh my goodness. Again, I could spend a lot of time on this. But let's go to the next slide. So we have urged Titus, we encourage your given in the first place to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of given. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. So notice now, right, that Paul writes them a letter of rebuke. And as a loving father, he's doing it for their benefit, for their correction. And he's, he's concerned about their, their response. Are they going to be the rebellious teenager who runs away from home and says, you know, I'm just going to strike it out on my own? Is it, are they going to be like the prodigal son? What, what, is, what is their response going to be? He's delighted that they choose to repent. They choose to restore fellowship with Paul. But Paul now wants to prove that restoration. I want to prove that you're truly walking in the fear of God. I, I want to prove that the grace of God is really upon your life. And, and, and again, in, in 1 Corinthians, we, he talks about speaking in tongues. He, he enumerates in chapter 12, the gifts of the Spirit. This was the church that did not come behind any gift. They had the gift of prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. They had the gifts of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and mercy and all the gifts were there right uh, they would have seen from the out been, they would have been seen from the outside as a successful church and yet first corinthians 13 paul says even though you have these gifts i want to show you a more excellent way right though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am what sounding brass and the tinkling symbol. So Paul now is writing to them and saying, listen, you, 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 you've been converted. You truly repent. You, you, you really now want to serve God and be my, 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 my disciples and, and be followers of me as I follow Christ? Prove it. <laughs> and the way that you prove that someone is truly converted 
is their willingness to show compassion. Ah, my goodness. That is the genuine proof that you are walking in the footsteps of Christ, that you will give to the needs of others. Praise God. That you're not just living for, remember, these are poor people. They could have easily said, well, I'm sorry, man. You know, I just I just get my little check and that's just enough for me, you know, just for myself. And I'm sorry, but I can't, I, they, they, they got to worry about themselves, right? That is the attitude that some people who call themselves Christians are. They speak in tongues, they run up and down the aisles, okay? And operate in the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul says, I need to prove that you're indeed children of god the proof that you're walking in the spirit of god is not how much tongues you speak is not how much gifts you have but it is in your compassion my goodness let's 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 move on next slide please i am not commanding you to do this but i am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches you know the generous grace of our lord jesus christ Though he has rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. So, so Paul desires them to show generosity among the other graces. We, 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 don't, we don't, you know, denounce the gifts. We want the gifts of the church to be in operation. But we got to understand that if Jesus Christ is the bread, he said, I am the bread of life. Well, the gifts are the crumbs, see? And there are too many people who are chasing the crumbs and not the bread. If you get the bread, you get the crumbs, all right? So if you truly have the graces of God in your life, the most definite evidence of this will be seen in your generosity. You can't say you're a Christian and you're mean and tight. Hello? You cannot say you're indeed a true Christian. And when I say mean and tight, now, again, we, we, we know the, the, the devil has corrupted a lot of things, and he has crept into the church, and the church is corrupted, all right? And, and we're going to see at the end of this lesson that this is really not a, about giving, but it's more about sharing, see? You know, he's not asking them to give so that some, some preacher could ride in a chariot, you know, and uh, fly in a plane. And, 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 and ride around a limo. That's, that's not what he was uh, encouraging them to give towards. These were genuine needs of suffering Christians. See? And that's really what giving should be all about. Okay? Again, Paul, as a bishop, as a pastor, as a man who probably spoke five or more language, had probably many doctorates, and would have been considered a great man of his day, went about building tents to supply to support himself. And when churches would give him an offering, he says, no, because I know you don't have it. That's the, that's the, that's the type of man Paul was. I don't know who some of our preachers are following, but Jesus said, foxes of holes, birds of nests. I don't even build myself a house, yet I'm a carpenter. See? And I'm not advocating some type of monk lifestyle either. What I'm saying is that you can only eat but so many meals a day, folks. All right? You know, you, 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 you only sleep for so many hours. All right? You don't, you don't need to be wearing gold outfits. Oh, my goodness. Let me, let me behave myself. All right. So uh, he, he wants them to show generosity, right? Uh, not by way of command, right? But... He wants them to emulate what the Macedonian church is doing. Praise God. If we're gonna, if we're gonna envy one another, if, if, if we're gonna contend with one another, Paul said we must, we must uh, 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 strive for love. Let's let's see if we can out love each other. You 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 wanna war with me? Don't, don't, don't war with me over petty stuff. War with me over who loves more. Try to outdo me in love. That's that's the, that's the spirit. That's the that's where the contention in the church could be. Well, you, you gave you gave a hundred. I'm giving a hundred and five. You 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 gave a a thousand percent. I'm gonna give a thousand and ten percent. You 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 served for a year. I'm gonna serve for a year and a half. You know, giving and loving. Praise God. Being generous to the work of God. That is 
the heart of Christianity. He says, that is the example that Christ set. All right? This is the example that Christ said. <clears throat> Giving should be taught on the basis of the blessings associated with it and not demanded or commanded for personal benefit. Okay? And I'm already in trouble, so I'm not going to talk about it, right? You don't need a thousand dollar line in church and a and a, and a, and a, and a five hundred dollar line and a hundred dollar line, and then you know it's like okay, the rest of y'all with your dollar bills, you know, whatever. Okay? No, no, no. Uh, 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 uh. Paul does not want money to be demanded because when it is demanded you lose your blessing if you're gonna give out a guilt you know you're not blessed by it okay if somebody gotta make you feel guilty then that's not the proper uh, reason to give might as well you don't give at all see and, and, and you don't hear those things praise god right remember when moses was building the tabernacle the bible says that they gave so much moses says it's enough which Pastor, you know, today would say, that's enough. I don't need no more thousand dollars. I don't need no more hundred dollars. Which pastor you, today you, you, you would hear that? See, be, be, because, because, because the, the, the mindset has changed. The mindset has shifted. Blessings, giving should be taught on the basis of blessings and not demanded or commanded for personal benefit. The giving Paul encouraged was for the benefit of the church, not for himself. Okay? I want us to understand how giving ought to be done. Because many people quote these scriptures from 2 Corinthians when, it, when it's offering time. Okay? When it's offering time, we it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know? They quote this. But, but understand that Paul was asking for money not for himself. Not for his own wealth. Not to bigger build, build a bigger building. Okay? That's not what he was asking for money for. He was collecting money from the Gentiles to bring it to saints who were suffering in a famine, saints. Praise God. That's the purpose of giving. And Paul saying, that, that is not something that I should demand from you. In other words, the compassion, the bubbles of mercy that should be flowing from you as a child of God should say, I, I see the need and I shouldn't have to wait for pastor to ask. Oh my God, I wish I had time. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. When you see a need, a sister is hungry, you don't need pastor to collect a benevolent offering. You know if a sister lost her job, you don't need for the church to call, praise God, for a general offering. Out of the compassion and love of God that is in you, Praise God, you give because you understand that when you give, you're giving to yourself. Praise God. What is, what is at stake is the reality for the genuine need or the genuine love, right, of, of, of their commitment to the apostolic mission. I want to know, are you committed to this thing? Are you committed to Christ? Are you committed to the gospel? Are you committed to the kingdom? The, the, the kingdom requires active faith. And active faith involves giving. There's no way you can truly say you believe in God and you don't become a giver. The church should not have to pry you, bribe you, or pump you. Praise God. If you are truly filled with the Holy Ghost, if you're truly walking in the Spirit of God, you should be a giver. Right? He wishes the Corinthians to imitate the church in Macedonia. Why? Because that is the path that Jesus traveled down. Okay? This grace of Jesus Christ carries a divine attribute. It is love in action. Praise God. If your love is in not in action, it's not love. If your faith is not in action, it's not faith. Like I said, we come on the line... And your name shows that you have logged in, but your mic is muted and we don't hear a peep out of you all night. Are you really on? See, we log on, but are we really on? Praise God. We say we believe, but do you truly believe? You say you love, but do you truly love? Well, Paul says the evidence, the evidence that you're really on is when you unmute your mic when it's time to worship. Is when you unmute your mic and pray when you're praying. When you get involved in the worship service. When you get involved in helping to read. I insert myself. I inject myself. Praise God into what is going on. 
That's how you love. That's how you show faith by putting it into action. Praise God. It is reaching out to help the undeserving. Right? This is what Christ did. Christ identified with our poverty by coming down to our lowly state. Praise God. And so they should see Christ's weakness, right? His self chosen poverty, abandoning himself of his divine prerogatives and becoming human. He made himself poor. Why? So that others, we could become rich. My, my, my. Praise God. Next slide, please. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. So one of the reasons I think a lot of people, and this is just an assumption, folks, uh, uh, one of the reasons I think a lot of people today are comfortable with the idea of not going to church is because I don't have to pay tithes. See, if you want to resign to, you know, man, I got all these bills and, you know, my goodness, I got my end of year statement from the church. You mean I gave so much money to the church, <laughs> you know? And, and there are folks who will easily, uh, 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 you know, accept the idea that you don't you don't need to go. I got Jesus in my heart. You know, I serve God. I don't need to go to church. And, and, and sometimes, uh, what is driving that is if I gotta go to church now, I gotta worry about giving. See, okay. Paul says, don't lose the desire to give. So if you don't want to belong to a church. That does not somehow absolve you of the requirement to give, folks. <laughs> See, we, we, we might convince ourselves of that, praise God, but, but, but that, that's, that's evidence that you're back sitting, okay? Because what Jesus did was he gave. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Giving is loving. Loving is giving. So don't think that somehow because you're no longer connected to a building or some structured institution that somehow you are somehow exempt from giving. See, that's, that's, that's a falsehood, right? That people want to uh, uh, live in. And again, it's an assumption on my part, okay? But what Paul wants this Corinthian church to understand is don't ever lose the desire to give. And, 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 to, and, and for Paul, there was more emphasis on that than the gift itself wow <laughs> okay sometimes we worry about what we're going to give paul says don't worry about what you're going to give worry about losing the desire to give praise god okay that is the giving must be in accordance with what you have not what you do not possess nobody's asking you to give what you don't have the woman had a mite. That's what she gave. Praise God. Nobody's demanding anything from you that you don't have. See, that's not what giving is all about. Again, there are people who, they try to do that, right? They try to extort money uh, from you under the guise of Christianity. No one will be criticized of the modest means you have, right? And no one is expecting exceptional sacrifices from you that you cannot afford. God does not consider the magnitude of the gift. What God is looking at is the proportion it bears to the means. What are you able to give? As long as you have the heart to give and the ability to give, Paul says, that's how you show the love of Christ. My goodness. That's how you show that Christ is really living in your life. Praise God. So don't, don't, don't try to... Talk yourself out of giving. Well, you know, I don't know how am I going to do this. And, da, 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 da. and we try to talk ourselves out of giving. Okay? But later on, we're going to look at it. Paul says, no, you must be intentional. Be purposeful in your giving. Let's go to the next slide, please. Of course. I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. 
right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. So again, Paul is saying, I don't want to you to distress yourself to set others at ease. I am completely against giving for the sake of benefiting some preacher who want to live a, life, a high lifestyle. I'm definitely against that, right? Okay, and guess what? Paul is against that too. That's what he's saying right here, okay? I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others. You, you know, you, 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 you already got a Benz, but, but because you want a Bentley, you know, you're going you're gonna to come online and tell me the Lord told me to give you $70. No, 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 no. Uh, this is all about, and, and watch this now, the church in Corinth, the church in Macedonia, is not that they were wealthy, but at this current time, the church in Jerusalem was suffering through a famine. They were in a less state than they were. So many times we look at the little we have and we think we can't give, but guess what? There's always somebody in a worse situation. See? So while you might think you don't have a lot, Paul says as long as there's a brother or a sister in Christ who has a need and who is in a worse condition you have, you are than you are in. If it's two slices of bread you got and they and they got none, Paul says give them one. I, I feel like I could preach on that. All right? Paul is calling for them to share. He says, you have plenty and you can help those. Guess what? Later, they will have plenty because guess what? Your day is coming. This is the law of reciprocity, folks. It is a law. It is, it is, it is, a, it is a, a, a law of nature. As gravity is a law, as inertia is a law, there is a law of reciprocity. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So the one who withholds from giving, guess what? You're withhold from giving to yourself. The one who extends his hands to give, guess what? He's giving to himself. And you need to understand that law. And the fact is there are people who don't know God or serve God, but they use that law and they benefit from it. And we say we know God. And yet we hold on and hoard that which is not ours in the first place. See? Let's, 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 let's move on. Next, next slide, please. Again, I could preach on this stuff. Next slide. Somebody read. I really don't need. Start again. I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to you. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that, that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to, be, to begin giving. So the Corinthian church were enthusiastic to give in so much it stirred up Macedonia. To give there was a competition who can give i want to give i want to give because giving is the, is the is the essence of my christian walk and now that macedonia has given uh so much that it impressed paul paul is writing to the corinthian church and he's saying uh, you promise to give i want you to fulfill your promise he's calling for a share of mutual regard and helpfulness on the part of this church to benefit the church sharing and helping to benefit the church. That's the purpose of giving, folks. When we talk about giving, think about sharing. We are sharing to benefit the church. Grace imposes obligations. So the Corinthians, out of their surplus, have a chance to demonstrate concern for those in Jerusalem, both in distress but also in their condition out of the out of Christ. I could go deeper into this to talk about how, uh, you know, because we know that uh, uh, the God that turned from the Jews because the Jews rejected him and turned to the Gentiles. So this was not just given to them financially, but the Gentiles would become the light to even win those who were, uh, who were Jews to Christ. 
So through their giving, not only would the church in Jerusalem be blessed, but Jews on a whole, even Jews in Jerusalem who were not Christians, by virtue of the Gentiles giving, they, they, they also would, would come to Christ and come to know God. Next slide, please. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment. If some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I told them, so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one giving grudgingly. So intentionality is what's at stake here, folks. That many of us, we walk into the house of God on a Sunday morning and we don't plan to give. We don't have an idea what we're giving. And then when it's offering time, we think, well, am I going to give or am I not going to give? And then, you know, whatever I find closest my hand, sometimes the smallest denominator, you know, I'll give a dollar, give a two dollar, give me for some change. And that's what I'm going to give. That's not how giving should be done, folks. Giving is an act of worship. Okay. When Christ gave himself on the cross for your sins, it was an act of worship. Okay. And so giving must be done intentionally. That means you're supposed to plan. You're supposed to purpose and be intentional. Again, nobody's putting a gun to your head and forcing you and saying, well, you got $1,000 this week. You got you to give $500. If all you want to give is $5 or $50, it's up to you. But make sure you're intentional about your giving. And Paul says you should give proportional to what you have received. See? Understanding that my giving is my sharing in the needs of others as in me sharing in others' needs so others are going to share in my needs. That is the premise for giving, folks. Okay? That is the basis for your giving. I intentionally plan and purpose within my heart to give proportionally to how God has blessed me, giving from the, the understanding that I am sharing. It's a sharing in the needs of others. Everybody is not rich all the time. Everybody doesn't have a big meal to eat at the end of the day. You go home and you're, you're full. Somebody's going home and they're empty. You might be able to drive and you put, you fill, fill up your, 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 your gas tank uh, 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 to drive, uh, you know, 70, 60, 70 dollars. Another person looking for a metro card, right? We're not all on the same level, but in giving, we share so that what? Everybody has alike. That is the attitude we should have towards giving, all right? And uh, then let's go to the next slide, please. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. All right. So, the more generous the gift, the richer will be the return, okay? The more generous the gift, the richer the return. And withholding more than is necessary will only lead to poverty. Here's what Proverbs chapter 11, 24 and 25 says. There is that scattereth or giveth and yet increases. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but tends to poverty. 25. The liberal soul shall be made fat and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. 
That's, that's a law, folks. That's a law that governs the universe. There are those who give, and if you give with the right attitude, the Bible says you will increase. And many of us, we're thinking we're going to increase by hoarding. If I work more hours, if I save more, if I invest the right way, if I don't give to the church, if I hold back my tithes, if I don't give my offering, if I don't do this, if I don't do this, I'm going to have more. And you find yourself digging a deeper hole and falling deeper and deeper into poverty. Because it's a law. See? Then he says, there is that withholdeth more and it tends to poverty. Right? So they're the one that, that gives. They give. And they have always. Then there are those who holds back and count everything and, and just, just tight with everything and yet you can't get ahead. But the liberal soul will be made fat and he that water it shall be watered. Here's what uh, Proverbs 19 verse 17 says. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth to the Lord and that which he hath given will he pay him again. God is going to pay you back. Oh my goodness. I'd love for God to owe me something. I don't know about you. Okay? Lend to the Lord. That means when you lend, somebody owe you. And God is going to pay you back? Wow. My goodness. Proverbs 22 verse 9 says, Proverbs 22 verse 9 says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. God can give you such abundant gifts that you will not feel the loss of a generous contribution to his service, right? So the appeal is that they should not be disinterested to reach their brethren in need. And the issue for Paul is not the amount of the gift, but just be involved in giving. My, my, my. If we could have a church of people who... It's not, oh, pastor, I can only give an hour. That's fine. I can only give a half hour. That's fine. Pastor, I can only do it on one Sunday a month. Guess what? That's fine. It's not the amount of the giving, but do something for the Lord. Give something to the house of God. Okay? Don't give with a grudging spirit, unwilling to let money go. You're so tight that somebody got to force it out of you. It should not be given by pressure. But we should be joyful and cheerful. It should, be a, it should be a delight. Praise God. We have our sister. She loves to garden. Praise God. And she was just out there last week beautifying the church or making the front look so beautiful. That's the spirit. It's not just about money. It's your time. It's your talent. What can you give unto the Lord? What are you giving to the Lord? We come to church as consumers. We want to hear our songs. We want to hear a good message. We want somebody to pray for us and we go home. That's not what the church is about folks that's not what the church is about praise god each and every one of us are meant to be a contributor it's not how much you give but be intentional proportionate to how god has blessed you if you can't sing god is not asking you to sing if you can't play an instrument god is not asking you to play the instrument but there's something you can do if you can cook cook if you can sweep sweep do whatever you can for the Lord and do it heartily. Praise God. Next slide, please. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity and Imagine our lack of faith, right? We believe God for the job. We believe God for the pay we get. And yet we don't believe God that he will multiply if we apply the principles. Really? Is it truly faith? Do we truly believe that God gave us the job? He gives the farmer the seed. He's the one who provides the seed. You know? What if the farmer sat down and said, you know what? <laughs> I don't know where the next seed is coming from. So let me just sit down and watch this seed. Huh? The farmer goes and sows the seed that God gave him. Who sends the rain on the seed? Who sends the sunshine on the seed? God causes the seed to grow and makes him to eat. See? So all your resources, 
if you learn to apply the principles that God has outlined, guess what? Your blessings, you will never fail. You will never be in want. Next slide, please. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully ex express their thanks to God. So imagine the homeless, the hungry, the naked, the poor, the thirsty, the lost, the unsaved. When we decide to give up our resources and our time to maybe buy them something to eat or give them a blanket when it's cold or teach a Bible study to someone. Imagine when that soul is revived and they begin to give God thanks. Guess what? It's as a result of your giving. Through your giving, you can actually cause others to praise God. Isn't that a worthwhile purpose to live, to cause others to praise God? By you withholding, they don't praise God. When God has given, the, given you the resource. That's what Jesus said, you know. I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me nothing to drink. See? When did we do that, Lord? As much as you did it not. See? So we are set forth as the light. We are children of God. And the way you demonstrate that you are truly children of God is not by gathering in four walls Sunday after Sunday, clapping and singing to every song, going to the altar, waiting for oil to pour on your head to go about the rest of the week to live your own life and do your own thing. That's not Christianity, folks. We live out our Christianity by allowing God to lead our lives daily as we give ourselves for the benefit of others. Last slide, please. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. So when we share one another's burdens, when we bear one another's crosses, guess what? There's none that is too poor amongst us. And yes, there is none that's too rich. Praise God. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about how before they take the Lord's Supper, some are half full and some are hungry. Paul says, you don't discern the Lord's body. There should never be that inequality within the church. Everybody's not going to be on the same level, but we shouldn't have anybody starving in the church while somebody else is eating full. Somebody should not be wearing cashmere, you know, and, and, and leopard skin while somebody else got one piece of shoes with the, with, with the bottom falling off, saints. Right? We share in each other's burdens. That is the ministry that God has called us. And by virtue of sharing, guess what? Everybody praises God. Everybody glorifies God alike. And so when I need help, guess what? I got somebody helping me, right? And the grace of God will flow through the body of Christ. I hope that this has been a blessing to some, if not all, today. We are going through the book of uh, Second Corinthians, I, I, I should have included in this lesson about how, when we studied Judges, how the various tribes faced their individual dilemmas, and they would call for the assistance of the other tribes. We went over Deborah's song, and this was what they faced, where they were not united uh, uh, when, it, when it came to the battles that they had to fight. And so Paul is enjoining the Corinthian church to fight in the common battle that the church fights. We all are fighting the same devil. We all want to get to the same heaven. How about if we just join together, folks? Amen? And support each other. Again, we are going through the book of 2 Corinthians. If it's your first time here, uh, hit that subscribe button. Praise God and share with your family and friends if you're learning something. Praise God. If you have any questions or anything you want us to discuss further, you can always type it. 
in the chat. Amen. We want to encourage, we want to edify, we want to build up each other. God bless you. Until next time.